So pretend that I have no idea what power dance technique is. Explain to me what your program is and why you created it. Well, um, 12 years or so ago, I moved down from New Jersey where I had my own ballet studio, uh, where I was able to do a lot of hours of ballet. And that's how I was trained in New York City, to have enough time to do preparatory type training for children's bodies, for their body awareness. And then when I moved down to North Carolina, sold my studio 12 years ago, I realized that there was very little time. So that was the biggest problem. I tried to get them to the bar and to have them start doing exercises and they were just copying me. They were mimicking me. They were doing things from the inside out. They had no idea where things were coming from. Um, a lot of the younger children were thrown to me at age, what, seven, eight, and nine without having been prepared at all. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to figure out a way, I've got to change what I'm doing because the old, the traditional format wasn't fitting into this new structure, this new generation of student where we're doing, first of all, so many things. You know, I mean, it's really kind of overwhelming to see the amount of classes that, that little children are taking. Um, and I don't know how we can possibly expect them to even really grasp a lot of the stuff that we're throwing them, not necessarily in their mind, but in their bodies. The body is much slower to process than the mind is. So I feel that we need to start training children more from a, from a physical, uh, visceral level rather than cognitive level. Mm -hmm. Both are really important, but more importantly, the program, uh, the Children's Hour of Power program that I developed um, based on Dorothy Lister's uh, pre-ballet program from mm -hmm. the Joffrey Ballet School starts at age three with getting the children on board and in tuned with their bodies and providing the necessary struggles that they need to figure their predispositions out at a very early age. And I really feel that's the root of so many things. In some respects, I feel it would be great for people to follow set curriculums all the way through the ages. I'm beginning to think that that's a very difficult thing to ask of people. I'm beginning to see that if you select specific ex specific exercises that are movement oriented and movement initiation oriented, you can really quickly help a child understand where movement comes from. Mm -hmm. And so the program starts with exercises like this and works through the ages all the way up to the most advanced levels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've answered your question, but. Yeah, yeah. So basically what you're saying is the program is designed to teach the students where movements come from mm -hmm. and not take as much time because you don't have right. you know, three hours worth of training for a young child anymore yes you know and you know you, you trained tr traditionally mm -hmm. at, a, at a traditional ballet school at the bar so many hours a week yep Joffrey school yeah. American ballet all the top yeah traditional ballet teachers exactly and, yeah. and that's that's great if you have that time but right. teachers like you and me we have 45 45 minutes once a week yes it's like you can't replicate that kind of specificity in, right. in, the mus in the muscle movements and right. the body awareness. Yes. So that's kind of where power dance technique came, right? You started with the hour of power and then moved to ballet bar none and then uh, kind of, I guess, reconstructed it yes. to the power dance technique. Yes, and the, f the thing is, um, when we're trying to give them, when we're trying to stick with the what in mm -hmm. the sense of trying to get through what we feel we need to do as ballet dancers, getting all through an entire ballet bar and those types of things. If a child needs to be able to take the ballet in, in, and apply it into other genres, it's very difficult to have an hour long bar or, or even a half an hour long bar, get through up all the way through batmans, petit batmans, and then get them out of the center and have them be balanced in their bodies, mm -hmm. have them be equal. The bar tends to be very one-sided, very static, so I feel that if you get them out in center right away, do floor work, do center vertical work, that their bodies are much more acclimated to be able to translate mm -hmm. the awareness of movement into other genres, mm -hmm. rather than worrying about, did I get to frappe, did I get to batman, did I get to, you know, yeah. I haven't taught a frappe in like 10 years. <laughs> you tend to start every class on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, I've actually started doing that in my classes as well, and I think part of that is because it grounds the student. But are there any other reasons why you structure your class the way that you do? Alignment. I mean, when you say the floor, the floor is a perfect reference point, you know. And so with Zena Vermette as an example, mm -hmm. she did, it was an hour and a half class maybe. She did three quarters of the class on the floor. And mm -hmm. then she got us up and she did, okay, 
plies, tendus, and she said, okay, now people, you can go. I'm thinking, wait a minute, lady, this is where my best stuff. This is where, this is where I really shine, is the bar. Now you're stopping after tendus, and it really, but it was very impactful for me because I thought, wait a minute, there's something to this. If you can understand what you're doing, right, with the support of the floor, which keeps your placement, your bones aligned, right, so that you can find just the amount of muscles that you need, the mystery muscles, right, and really use the floor as a reference point for when you stand up, you don't need to do an entire bar necessarily, unless you're going to, you know, off to a ballet career. You do need that. But most of the students that I work with don't need to be doing the entire bar to really get the essence and the benefit of what ballet has to offer. Mm -hmm. It's the mechanisms of the movements. It's understanding where your body is in space, like you just said. Inside out, I, I'm gonna use an analogy, you can cut this or not, but I just absolutely love it because it's, if you excuse me, camera people, audience, are watching, <laughs> but I think it's a perfect analogy. I'm noticing that this is, it is a big disconnect and there's a big chasm here. There's a big, um, I think, misunderstanding. Most students, when they're at the bar, hold absolutely everything. And I equate that to constipation. They're holding, <laughs> like I said, and they're holding on to absolutely every single muscle. Yeah. They're hardly breathing yeah. because they think ballet is all this stiff, tight <gasps> stuff. Yeah. And then when they come out to center, it's the complete opposite. It's diarrhea. They have no <laughs> idea what to control. They're flailing. They're all over the place yeah. because they've had nothing but static exercises yeah. and now they're supposed to come out and do dynamic work yeah. and and in a small amount of time to make the case to the child that it's all the same is very difficult you yeah. can't tell them that they have to experience it so starting on the floor allows me to give them stability in the core in their entire torso so that there's freedom to move the bones full range of motion and then we identify just the muscles that they need just the minimum amount of muscles. They don't realize that the muscles they use for ballet are the same that they use for every other genre. They think ballet is its own separate entity. Mm -hmm. But when they start to understand that the mechanisms, that movement initiation comes from the range of motion in their hip and shoulder knobs, and they don't need as many muscles as they're holding, because extensions are big, right? Everybody right. wants extension. They cannot okay. have the extensions if they're gripping. Mm -hmm. There's no way that they can do it. They also can't have the power of their spring and their jump the more rotation they can access at the bottom of the plie. Mm -hmm. But they can only do it if they're holding the rotators mm -hmm. and not holding in the, in mm -hmm. the monster muscles, the big. Easy to access, easy to find muscles. The survival muscles, the muscles that are gonna make you do whatever you need to do by hook or by crook. Those muscles are there to save face. They're not there to really help us improve our technique. Mm -hmm. So they're the obvious muscles that everybody immediately uses. That's why it's so important to start the children correctly from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because once they start using the monster muscles, the outside in muscles, it's very difficult to retrain. It is. Rewiring your body is really hard. And I know when I first started taking some of your lessons, it was really difficult for me. I was, I was trained to squeeze my glutes um, my entire dance training and knew that there was another muscle that I was supposed to activate but couldn't figure out where it was or how, what it felt like or any mm -hmm. of that. And mm -hmm. your exercises, you know, over a series, I mean, first couple lessons, not so much. I couldn't find it. But... You know, after a while, you, you figure out where that's supposed to come from, and then you can start to really train and, and rewire yourself, and you catch yourself um, falling back into those old habits, and you can change it. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with, you know, what this conference is all about, injury prevention and mm -hmm. setting students up for success from the get-go. Um, you know, I know one time you told me students from the ages of three to nine have a Un unbelievable, limitless potential. Oh, yeah. You can do anything. With them. Yeah. And all body types. Mm -hmm. All body types, all mm -hmm. predispositions, they can figure things out. You give them the right exercises, yeah. that's the key, mm -hmm. to trust what you're doing. If you trust your process, they're going to figure their bodies out. Mm -hmm. So that, oh, as I was going to say about the floor and mm -hmm. the wall, I use the wall a lot too. The more reference points for groundedness you can give them, the freer the muscles will be. Yeah. Right, so if it feels right, it looks right, it is right. We're so trying to do outside in and speak to the children and give them corrections. And I got tired of giving the same correction. Yeah. In 40 years of teaching, I really was desperate. I had to figure out a way to help the children make the connection with the correction for themselves. Yeah. If they're gonna feel it, they're gonna own it, they're gonna do it, my job's gonna be easier. I mean, what teacher would not want their job to be easier? What teacher yeah. would not want their ballet program to effortlessly and seamlessly translate into other genres. I mean, that is like the magic of this power dance program. Mm -hmm. And you only need a few key exercises that you do on a regular basis.
to get the children to understand what they're doing. Once they do, you get them to do the work. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to gripe and they're not going to complain and they're not going to be bored. Mm -hmm. It's very dynamic, this work. This work is very it's interesting. Very, you do. You have to really focus on what you're doing and, and you do a lot of um, activating things at the same time and then doing one or the other and then both. And, you know, another thing that, that you do that I've never seen any other teacher do is you train the students to identify a part of their body that's weaker than another part mm -hmm. and do extra training on their weaker. So like when we're doing an exercise, we'll do weaker leg, stronger leg, weaker leg, mm -hmm. instead of just one leg and then the other leg. So we don't just do right and left, you do weaker, stronger, weaker, so that you can get that extra training because one bad side is two bad sides. Yes, you know? and transitions. Yeah. People don't say, all I say in conventions, right? Competitions at higher levels especially, yeah. Work on your transitions, work on your transitions. But if you're not rotating from the top, right? And if you're not working with balanced equality, mm -hmm. you're not gonna have an equally weighted fit when mm -hmm. you go from one position to the next. Your mm -hmm. transitions are gonna naturally be off. There's just no way. Then the takeoff for the next jump is gonna be off. So you exactly. want higher jumps, you need equality in your landings. Mm -hmm. You talked about, you know, uh, correcting one thing at a time, piecemeal corrections. Yeah. You know, that I try to design exercises that require the body to work all in one movement. Using some of the floor techniques, I get to have the children identify one section at a time. For instance, they'll identify their shoulder knobs first, the upper deck, mm -hmm. and they'll establish that. And we do roll your boats and all sorts of things for that. And I increase them each week, or I change them up a little bit so that they're interesting, but they're all dealing with the same movement initiation at its core. Where is it coming from? Then we'll add the hip knobs. So slowly we'll build the one pieceness of it. And so when I'm able to get them to move in one piece, it resolves so many of the piecemeal corrections. How often do we say, point your feet? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to address that now, but that's like a mm -hmm. big issue yeah. for getting a child very young and they're very, as you said, open, or we were talking about, very mm -hmm. open and receptive. And the golden years are ages three to nine, mm -hmm. where they don't have a lot of habitual movement yet. And they're very open to concepts. Yeah, their brains are just sponges for muscle memory. Muscle memory mm -hmm. is built best at that age because mm -hmm. there are not already paths that are worn down. I like to compare muscle memory to a forest, and the more often you go down a path, that path becomes worn down. Yes. And that's kind of the way that our brain's muscle memory works. And mm -hmm. so with a young child, they don't have that many worn down paths yet. Yes. So you can make your path go wherever you want it to go, but you've mm -hmm. got to do it correctly from the get-go. You know, and, and and if you can catch them before they make the mistake, and I think that's one of the amazing things about your program is you are you're training them from the inside out. You're teaching them you're teaching them backwards than any other kind of technique out there. You're not teaching them steps first, you're not teaching them moves first, you're not teaching them positions first. You're teaching them how to move, which muscles to use, where their rotation comes from, how to isolate, how to move two things at one time, how to connect those things, and that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. revolutionary. Thank you, but it's also desperation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really was. It was, it's, it's um, prevented, prevented. Preventive. Mm -hmm. It's a preventive approach. And sometimes we think, well, I don't have the time to do that. Right. You know, but if you don't have the time to do it, it's going to come right in that fluffy butt later on. <laughs> I mean, it really, really is. Will, you know, the teachers will. now are clamoring in, in some How do I get my teenagers to wear toes? Right, yeah. but while we had an opportunity, we had numerous opportunities way, way back when. And there are so many simple things that you can do, and these are the things that I've developed. It's yeah. quite, quite remarkable what you can do. And I, I read a, a few things from very top coaches who said, if you start an exercise with a child, you have to be very careful that you don't allow them to do it wrong. So giving them too much too soon is another thing that we, we tend to do. We do. If we hold back, our job is to hold back. Our job is to say, wait a minute, and to, to sort of have the game plan. Mm -hmm. We're gonna let them struggle with this. Sometimes it's very hard for the eyeballs. We let them struggle, but if we trust our process, if we trust our curriculum, we know that this struggle, this time is absolutely crucial for them to be figuring things out, absolutely mm -hmm. crucial. And that we know that later on, it's gonna pay off dividends enormously because then we're gonna have what we want. Mm -hmm. To go back in there after the fact, you know, is like ass backwards, excuse me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense to go, to make, create problems, right. mm -hmm. and then to try to go back and fix, fix them. them. You know, and then it's also frustrating for the children when there's so many things we can do in the early stages. And like I yeah. said, it doesn't have to be major curriculum. It can be a few exercises here and there. Or even just, you know, like you said, this. making sure that they do it right from the get-go, not making compromises on our side, like, oh, well, mm -hmm. I'll deal with that later kind of thing. 
we, a lot of teachers, and me included, I catch myself doing it. I have to stop myself and be like, no, we're not going to deal with it later. We're going to deal with it now. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, five years from now, you're still not going to be able to do that. Yes. You know? I yes. Mean, it's the same correction. It's amazing yeah. when I go around to do workshops in different studios. And even when I judge competitions. Do you, do you see the same corrections for it's different It's the students? same exact corrections for every level. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I will start at a, at a work in a studio. Yeah. At, you know, like on a very early Sunday morning. And I will start with the youngest level. And it is uncanny that when I get to the top level. You're saying the same thing. It's the same corrections. Oh They've goodness. not made the connection with those corrections. Yeah. Because they didn't. It's the, it's the essence of their movement that they're going to constantly recreate. And if the essence of the movement isn't where it should be. It's going to constantly be wrong. Mm -hmm. You have to, and really, it's either right or wrong when it comes to mechanisms. Right. You yeah. Know? I mean, there are different styles of things. Yes. Like I said, ballet bar is the root of everything. If you're doing it right, it's just the that the steps change. Mm -hmm. But where the movement's coming from is the same for all genres, mm -hmm. and I can't say that enough because there's such a misunderstanding. One of the reasons why children resist the ballet bar is because they think, oh, that's something different. Oh, I don't want to do that. Once they understand that it actually flows, it's absolutely the same movement. Mm -hmm same mechanism, just different types of movements, different qualities of movements, mm -hmm. then they're much more excited to do the ballet. I don't have to force kids to yeah. do the work because That's they great. understand the benefit. That's great. The value. Yeah. And so you work with students that are not just ballet. You you work with all sorts of, I mean, you mm -hmm. work with ice skaters. Ice skaters too. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and that's really why this program, and this how this program has developed is because I've had children with so many different issues and so many different needs that I've had to come up Mm -hmm. with solutions and there's a wonderful saying if the children don't learn the way I teach I have to teach the way they learn yeah someone said that to me once I like that yeah and my quote my saying was um I can't I can no longer teach just to my knowledge I have to teach to their need so the more need there has been in my life in the last 12 years with what's been in front of me the more opportunity it's been for me to create new things mm -hmm. so this is necessary this process this evolution for me i really don't know if i could have continued teaching mm -hmm. because i was trying to fit the ballet model the traditional ballet model into a square around into a square mm -hmm. and i couldn't make it fit mm -hmm. and i was becoming frustrated and unhappy and i thought well i've got to do something different mm -hmm. and it's working i mean it's so, magical yeah. Yeah. yeah and to see the children get excited about doing work i mean really the mother issue is work ethic yeah. Children don't want to work. So we're caving in a lot of us. We're caving in to make it fun. The point is this is work and it's fun. One more thing. The young children's program, the ages three to nine, they learn right from the beginning that struggle, that work is part of it. Mm -hmm. It's not separate. So they're struggling with things. When I teach teacher conferences, I will do the ages three to five program, mm -hmm. the magic circle. The teachers are huffing and puffing and blowing the house down. They are literally, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, my core, I can't come up from this thing. <laughs> they are just so worn out from yeah. those exercises. And I have the children doing it within three months. Oh, that's great. So that they realize, oh my gosh, this isn't a hurtful thing. Now that nowadays, all you hear, this hurts. This hurts, I know, I know. One of the first things I do at the beginning of the school year is I say, okay, there's a difference between pain and discomfort. And you're gonna have a lot of discomfort in this class. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and they have to differentiate because yeah. pain. I said, what is? What do you think pain registers in the brain? Every one of them at all ages say that's. I say, do you think the brain thinks that's positive? And they say no. They know that the brain thinks pain and hurt is a negative. Okay. So well, if you're starting off right now because you're stretching and you feel pain, you're telling your brain it's not good. How? Where are we going from there? This is you want to be a dancer. This is yeah. part and parcel of what you have to accept to do. Surrender to the struggle, surrender. I say expect and respect the struggle, but you don't tell them that. You help them experience that. Mm -hmm. It's like being a parent. You can't tell them anything. <laughs> yeah. They have to see it. They yeah. have to experience it for yeah. themselves. That's the key. Yeah, I've started congratulating them when um, we'll do, you know, pumping the arms flying across the world. Mm. And, um, you know, oh, my arms are on fire. And I start congratulating them when their arms yes. start to catch yes. on fire. It's that means like, they've got a pulse. Yeah. <laughs> this hurts. I'm well, like, good. That means you're still alive. You're getting stronger. This yes. is a good thing. We're moving forward. <laughs> yes. Not, no floppy arms anymore. Yes. This is great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then if you can do something that directly relates to that, like a pirouette, I mean, I have to say that there are, I, I don't, don't get me wrong, there yeah. are goodies that I, I allow them to have. But I, I, but I make sure that they do the work first. It's like yes. eating your spinach and then getting the Snickers bar. <laughs> you have to, but we have to all be united as yeah. teachers, not to just throw constantly throw them Snickers bars. Yeah. You know, and part of the injury prevention, and we want exactly. to get to that, is that we're so pressured these days. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, there's a lot of different ways that injuries can happen for kids in dance, but mm -hmm. one of them is them getting steps that they're not ready for. Yeah. 
um, what do you think would be, in your opinion, what are some of the injuries that you run into most often? Because you go around the different studios mm -hmm. and you do workshops. What the number one that I'm noticing is becoming an epidemic uh -huh. is the hip issue. Yeah. It's the grinding, the popping, okay. the terrible intense pain. And what's interesting is you see it through the older level. So mm -hmm. you don't see it as much in the younger groups but because that's where they're it starts. That's where it yeah. starts. Because I see them in the schools. Like I said, I can see the progression starting with young children. I can see them doing bot months, hiking the hip mm -hmm. up. I can see them trying to hold the leg up here. Mm -hmm. And it's the wear and tear and invariably the weaker leg, the one that's constantly being up and down, yeah. you know, thrusted and hoisted up and down without rotating mm -hmm. is the one that's the worse or worse mm -hmm. one. This one, the left one, the stronger one isn't always as bad, but they're both, mm -hmm. they're both giving them trouble. And I'm noticing, I'm hearing that there's a new category at the doctor's office called dancer hip. Yeah. And I never knew about that. Before. Dancer hip, snapping hip. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I've actually, I've got, now that you mentioned it, I've got a couple kids, you know, complaining about that and we've had to stop and you know, look at our alignment and look at our posture and kind of mm -hmm. figure out, you know, well, where is your alignment? And I actually had that issue as well mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school until I realized that my alignment was completely off in my hip. I couldn't mm -hmm. do a develop a from retire and extend to the side without my hip completely just locking up. Mm -hmm. And I had to actually reposition my leg in the socket. But then, you know, the more, the more rotation that I learned, I learned how to actually control my body where my rotation came from, now I can spiral and develop it just fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at that time it was like, there was a misunderstanding of where the develop pay came from. Yes. And so that's, you know, uh, inevitably what led to the injury. Right. So, yeah. But the children don't understand even that the bones are circular. Or like say, circular! Yeah. <laughs> and so I get them on the floor. I mean, one of the very first exercises we do at age three is the rocks around the clock. Yeah. Where their legs are in a straddle, and their arms are out and then they do one o'clock, they pull the hands and the heels together mm -hmm. as they go around they go each, the around. each mm -hmm. clock, each each uh, number on the clock. And little by little by little, they start to initiation with rotation, both the shoulders and the hip knob. So already we're having them figure out their full range of motion mm -hmm. on the bone level. Mm -hmm. What's happening is I'm also going around and seeing the children when I say, okay, show me your straddle, they're usually here. They think this is where their, their turnout is. Right. And so that they get the extension in the same place. But mm -hmm. if they realize that the rotation is different than the location, then they can start actually getting more freedom yeah. of movement and getting the rotators to engage. So they're not hiking and gripping. Mm -hmm. They may not be quite as far to the side, but once they can stabilize that in the right place and they can open them out. Mm -hmm. It's one of the problems with second turns, up oh, and yeah. down, up and down, because they're not feeling the placement. Mm -hmm. But again, early on, on the floor, at the wall, so many simple things you can do mm -hmm. just to help them to feel the full range of motion. And yeah. then they won't go back to that place where everything's flippy that we do. And then they won't have that. It's just like you said, what is injury prevention? Injury prevention is body awareness. Mm -hmm. It's body awareness at the ear earliest levels. It really, really is yeah. across the board. Yeah. So that is the biggest issue. Sometimes knee problems, but that stems from turnout. It does. Mm -hmm. Right, directly. And feet problems. Feet problems. So the, the number one in the survey mm -hmm. that we did, the number one, request from teachers was to help them learn how to point their feet. Mm. And I see that as not a foot issue. Yeah, I teach a lot of one-pieceness elongation right. exercises so that they learn that if, if I'm giving a point the foot cor correction, it's a piecemeal correction for a piecemeal problem. Yeah, If I teach elongation rotation from the top of the leg to the tip of the toes, I'm not having to get piecemeal corrections because the whole leg is extended in one piece. They realize it's an elastic band. Mm -hmm. It's not just a foot, it's not just a knee. It resolves what? Five different, issues. Five yeah. different <laughs> issues. But they learn that yeah. by repetition. If you look at some of the you know ballet steps that we that we struggle to teach, degage and um, glissade and ensemble, I mean those are all basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, everything in ballet comes down to one of two things, a plie or a tendu. Yes. Everything in ballet is a plie or a tendu. Mm -hmm. It's a compression or it's an elongation. Mm -hmm. And so if you can teach compression and elongation then the student will learn to apply that same thing to every single one of those steps. Now you don't have to teach every single one of those steps. They, they can do anything. Yeah. They can do anything you ask them. And you were the one that commented on this program when you first started taking it. You said, Miss Anna, you teach concept before content. Concept is the dynamics. How do things move? How do things work? Mm 
If you can give them that, and you know, many people take my program after they've had their careers. Mm -hmm. I, I work with many college students. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, Miss Eileen, I did not learn any of this sort of stuff till I went to college. Oh, yeah. It was, and even in college, somewhat, it's somewhat limited, but they started to learn dynamics of movement. Mm -hmm. Where does movement come from? Long after they had a career. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate, and it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. We can teach, and the children can embrace and enjoy it so much more. Yeah. They won't be injured, they'll enjoy it. They'll learn work ethic because they'll see that work equals success. Mm -hmm. Struggle equals accomplishment. Mm -hmm. They will see that this is how it works. Our bodies have not progressed, right, since cavemen days. Some of us <laughs> actually still behave like that. <laughs> but yeah, why do you think we, we're still struggling with the same things? Yeah, yeah. Right. So we have to be very vigilant as teachers to rein the children back in. You know, they'll get the extensions. The mm -hmm. legs will go up there, but if you give them the understanding first, they will get the things that they want. Mm -hmm. And higher leaps and everything will come with it. Oh, yeah. But we have to be, we are the ones that have to hold them back. We have to be the ones that train them. It can't be the other way around. Your students are so focused in class. It's unbelievable. I mean, they don't chit chat. They don't goof off. They don't do eye service. They don't only do the exercise correctly when you're watching and then when you turn away and look over here then they're being lazy again they don't do that mm -hmm. and they have a high amount of um investment and well and but, but body awareness mm -hmm. they know where they are in space and they're very precise they're very careful i find that a lot of kids um just kind of throw themselves into a shape mm -hmm. um, and i think one of the reasons why why your classes are like that is because you don't demonstrate you, mm. you talk to your students, you very carefully and specifically explain, okay, I want you to uh, bend this knee and extend this leg and point this toe and you mm. know, do very, very specific instructions, but you don't get on the floor and do it with them. Um, very rarely have I seen you actually do a combination with mm -hmm. your students. Most of the time you just verbally give them instructions and when they struggle with the instruction, you don't just you know walk over there and adjust them or show them or, or whatever. You let them figure it out on their own and connect with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Why do you choose to do that aside from you know the injury with your hip? The exercises have been specifically designed. They're very organic. My philosophy is that there's so much outside in follow the teacher, mimic the teacher, do it. Mm -hmm. One student was actually doing a tondu after doing a series of things that I had given him. He said, Miss Eileen, I'm finally going through my tondu, not to my tondu. I'm very careful not to show stuff. And the way my combinations are designed, it's not a lot of arm and head. You know, it's very mm -hmm. straightforward, simple modification of arms. They're very simple, but very challenging. So my whole premise philosophy is, I want them not to see an image, I want them to feel mm -hmm. and experience. I want this to be an experiential more than a visual. So really they are they have to tap in so deeply into their beings on so, such a deep fundamental level to call upon their resources to get something to come from that place. They have to really dig. Mm -hmm. It creates responsibility, ownership, focus. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I never noticed what you were talking about because I just expected the bad jokes. <laughs> Tell lots of bad jokes, people. Um, but it really, I think it's because I, I require accountability. Mm -hmm. My studio in Jersey, I did an hour long bar. Yeah. And that was my dream. I loved bar. I love bar. I loved the process <laughs> of the bar, but part of it was I understood it. Yeah. And even after my training and after my performing career, I did floor bar with Tina Romet in New yeah. York City. And I learned even deeper places in my body for rotation by doing floor bar yeah. than I had ever in my career. So I wish I had had that available to me. And so what I do is I incorporate my version of floor bar and then build things into vertical, into center. So the child has to struggle through things in order to maintain balance. Mm -hmm. I say turnout's a full-time job. The problem is we say rotate, rotate, turn out, turn out. First of all, when I go into a studio, I've been in many workshops, I say, what is turn out? Why, why, do you, why are you told to turn out? And they roll their eyes like they hear, you know, they tuned you out or they've heard you so many times say turn out. They don't even know what turn out is. Yeah. They don't even know why they have to do it. Yeah. So I say, well, turn out, number one, is balance. But, but most of all, it's power. You know, so elongation and rotation, that's the essence of all movement. Spring, power, 
creating that through the shoulders and the hip knobs. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, and they don't really understand it. So that they tune you out, you're not gonna get the best out of them if they've already tuned you out. Mm -hmm. And if you're standing in a very static position, you're never getting to know how much effort is really required for turnout. Mm -hmm. So it's their understanding, I think, that's extremely limited. If we can help them understand through exercises what we want from them, it makes our job so much easier. Locate the bones, activate the mystery muscles, integrate everything so it moves as one and replicate. Repeat, repeat, repeat. repeat. That's the formula. It's mm -hmm. very straightforward. It's not, this is not a mystery. Yeah. You know, it's logical. And once the children get that, they understand that. It's, it's really, it's yeah. quite remarkable. I'm so excited because I feel like we're getting to document this beautiful unfolding and evolution. And if you help them to understand it and you reveal the mystery behind it to where they're feeling like they're owning their bodies and they're the captains of their own ships, all of a sudden they can't wait to do it. Well, I like this program because a lot of it talks about circulation of the body articulation, rotation, and ego elongation. The different exercises Miss Eileen has us do really makes you feel those muscles and know how to use them. It is a deep and dimensional fast track and it's going to give them everything that we really want for them. Not just the leaps, not just the legs, not just the turns, but we're giving them all the spaces in between. Knowing that your hips are circular, your femur bones are circular, helps you to manipulate the movement the way that you want to achieve it in dancing. We're giving them something with dimension, something with quality, and something with integrity. And it's going to empower them, not just as dancers, but as people too.